I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Our guest today is renowned Pittsburgh Post-Gazette columnist and book review editor Tony Norman. Tony began his journalism career covering pop culture, eventually serving as the Post-Gazette's pop music and culture editor. He is a former editorial board member of the Post-Gazette and is the current vice president of the board of the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. For the past 24 years, Tony has written his award-winning column about the most pressing issues of the day and in the process has proven to be an important and eloquent voice of truth. He has modestly described himself as a quote, distracted former political science major, but he's so much more than that. He is a writer in a time when there is no shortage of things to write about. Tony, welcome to We Can Be. Great to be here, Grant. Thanks for the invitation. You know, I was about to tell you that my dad, during his editorial cartooning days, told me that when the current president was elected, he was so disappointed because he had retired and wasn't able to cartoon anymore. Mm. And he said, I'd waited my whole life for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> it must be bittersweet to be living in a time when there is so much to write about and cover. Oh, yeah, it is bittersweet. And if I could just backtrack one second, one of my proudest possessions is a portrait that your dad did of me when I was a uh, Knight Wallace uh, Fellowship winner uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, He did it for me when he came in to do a big lecture, and it was awesome. I asked him some questions he thought were really funny, and he just did a portrait of me. (laughs) Framed. It's one of my proudest. I love it. I love it. One day I'd love to see it. Thank you for sharing that. Now, you've been writing about the world around you for over 30 years now. How does this moment in time feel different to you, and how is it influencing your writing? First of all, it does feel different, because while I'm old enough to remember previous revolutionary moments, they happened when I was a child, but this feels like a moment that can actually resort in dramatic reordering of the social order to an extent that... The election of Barack Obama couldn't match, or 9-11. This feels like a moment that can result in positive change. I think the confluence of an election coming up and the righteous anger and rage of populists that are looking for dramatic change, and just sort of like a much more widespread understanding that the social order is unfair. That was always the missing element in the past. And people are sort of looking at various systems and saying, you know what, this reinforces an unfairness and injustice over here, and et cetera, et cetera. There's no sort of naive sort of reductionism. It's like people are finally catching on to the fact that this is a system. And it isn't just racism, it's classism, it's ageism, and that only certain people or certain groups profit from it. And we're all starting to learn, you know what, we have a common enemy. And that's what makes this moment feel different. There really is something clarifying that is happening, I think, about the nature of the inequality that exists in our society and the ways in which it's baked into the system itself. You know, one of the things I admire about you is the way in which you call that out. It's the meat of what we want to talk about, but I want to explore a little bit of how you got to where you are. You started writing about music and pop culture, I think, is your first book. I mean, I literally started as a clerk and and just sort of got promoted fairly quickly. It just took eight, nine months. You've said that there was a moment at a David Bowie Nine Inch Nails concert that (laughs) cemented your desire to move beyond that beat and cover sort of more serious subjects. Can you relate that story to me? Oh, man, you've been doing your research here, Grant. Wow. We try. We try. (laughs) The version of the story that I'm going to tell is hopefully less disgusting. But uh, in 1995, the very last concert of the year at what was then known as Star Lake Amphitheater featured David Bowie as the co-headliner with Nine Inch Nails. It was one of those shows that was very goth, and it was like the year that Marilyn Manson was like the biggest pop star in the world. So everyone, at least all the white kids, wore black shirts, and it was like this whole... I'm going to sell my soul to the devil sort of vibe that was permeating uh, American pop culture. And so it was a Saturday in October. 
And I went to a wedding in Shady Side, so I was still dressed in my silver suit. Imagine I get there, it's a pretty much sold out show. I think it's the capacity is 24,000. I'm literally the only black guy there that I can see. I'm wearing a suit. They escort me to my seat, critics row, and it's sort of blocked off from everyone else. You know, we got people in front of us and people behind us, but we have pretty much a whole row to ourselves. And there's nothing but the smell of marijuana in the air and I got rednecks behind me and I got golf boys in front of me and the whole thing. There's so much like light and explosion coming from the stage. I'm able to use that light to write my notes about what's going on on stage. And finally, I stand up, I'm wearing my nice suit and the people behind me, a guy behind me decides that he's gonna lean forward and vomit all oh my over God. my seat. Now I'm staring at the stage. I don't see what's happening. The smell comes over me like a cloud, a fetid cloud. Oh my God. My colleagues, you know, from the other newspapers turn around, they're horrified. They're like pointing at something. And I'm like, I'm just writing down what, what's happening on stage. At that point, Trent Reznor and David Bowie are duetting. And I just want to get the details like, what song is that? And, and I feel the spatter on my back pants. I turn around and I see this guy leaning over my chair, just like the last drips of it just pouring oh. out on the seat. And at that point, I see my spattered pants. I say, I am way too old for this. I can't do this <laughs> another day. That following Monday, I went in, I found John Craig, and I said, I can't do this anymore. Make me a general interest columnist. I can't do this. John was the iconic former uh, late editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette during what I think of as its heyday. And that story alone proves why you're a writer. Talk about setting a scene. And I kind (laughs) of love that that was the less gross version. That was the less (laughs) gross version. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You made that decision at that point to write more seriously and then to write a column about race, politics, popular culture, religion, the absurdity Mm -hmm. of life or whatever strikes my fancy was how you put it. This is 1996. You were the first black columnist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I remember Pittsburgh in 1996. The racial politics were in this town. It just deeply segregated and entrenched racism, and it was both overt and hidden. Yeah. What was it like to be the first black columnist to the Post-Gazette, and what sort of reception did you get in the community? Well, first of all, when I went to John with the request for a, a change of venue in terms of my beat, he said, well, 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 what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Like, um, what, do you, what, do you, what would you want to write if you're not going to write pop music, pop culture or whatever? Because uh, what else are you good at? I said, well, I think that I like to try my hand at doing a column, a column about race and politics in Pittsburgh, because there are a lot of things happening here and a lot of things I like to comment on that isn't necessarily appropriate for a pop music writer, say. He said, we're not necessarily looking for a black columnist. We're just looking for good columnists. Do you think you can be a good columnist and not just a black columnist? And I said, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. But yeah, (laughs) yeah." he said, because if it doesn't work, you know what? We can just we can just cut it. People don't like it. We'll just cut it. And I said, that's not very supportive, but (laughs) (laughs) let let me try it. He says, well, you know, this is just probationary. So. I wrote a couple of tryout columns, and it took a couple weeks, but he finally got back to me. And I said, well, what do you think of the columns, John? And he says, I really didn't read them very carefully, but next Friday, you know, your column appears, and we'll just see, and we'll just leave it to the people to decide. But it's just probationary. Hmm. The column appears, and the reaction, of course, is shock. I mean, a lot of folks were just not used to seeing a Black face above a column in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It was much more understood and common at the Tribune Review, but not at the Post-Gazette, which ironically enough was the liberal newspaper. Right. So there was like a lot of pushback from the readers and a lot of initially bad letters to the editor uh, and to me and to John. I was getting a little nervous because it was probationary, I thought. And so one month became two months, became three months. And finally I cornered John I said, come on, man, you must have read my columns by now. They've been running regularly. What do you think? And he says, 
Yeah, they're fine. They're fine. So I said, am I going to be a regular now? He says, well, if you weren't doing a good job, we would have cut you already. So right now, yeah, let's just extend your probation for another few months. But he did send me a, a really sweet letter, maybe six months into the column. It says, apropos of nothing, look for an extra and a substantial raise in your paycheck going forward. I mean, it put me in another tax bracket. <laughs> but he That's could great. never bring himself to say, you're the guy, you know, you're in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the insight into the world of journalism in that story, but I'm also horrified by the racist reaction that you yeah. had to put up with. What is amazing to me is that recently the Post-Gazette made national headlines again after editors sidelined two black journalists, a reporter and a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, from covering Black Lives Matter protests. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette is facing national criticism after the Newspaper Guild says the paper removed two black journalists from covering the protests. So this escalating issue began with this tweet from Alexis Johnson. She tweeted in part, quote, horrifying scenes and aftermath from selfish looters who don't care about this city. Oh wait, sorry, no, these are pictures from a Kenny Chesney concert tailgate. One of them had posted a satirical tweet comparing the relatively peaceful protests in Pittsburgh with the mess left by Kenny Chesney concert goers. Yeah. By the way, I thought that tweet was brilliant. And from a journalism standpoint, it was benign. What did you think as you saw this unfold? And how did it feel for you as a journalist inside the paper? And how did it feel to write about it? It was obviously disappointing because it was an unforced error on a part of the Post-Gazette's management. I think in any other workplace, it would have been handled more discreetly and more constructively. And I don't quite understand why the first reaction was even punitive, given the fact that she was so integral to our coverage. She's the one that gets there at 6.30 in the morning. So that's like a key position. She is making pitches for coverage for that day. She's generating ideas. The fact that she's on that beat means that there's already a, a lot of trust in her and her ability to do the job. I was told it violated our social media policy. They kept calling it an educational conversation. Um, but there was no warning. There was no, hey, can you take the tweet down? By Monday morning, they had decided that I was no longer able to cover it. I'm disappointed that I'm not out there covering these protests. When I put my cameras down and take my uh, press badges off, I'm a black man in America. It devolved very quickly into this confrontational, we'll show you who's boss sort of thing. Now, had I been in management, had I been at the table, after all of this sort of blew up, I would have done what I considered the, the only smart thing. If they were casting aspersions upon her objectivity, then you simply say to Alexis Johnson, well, now you're spoiled food. So I guess we'll just have to make you a columnist so you can have an opinion so that you can go out there and <laughs> say what you think. Yeah. And it will be added value because we've never had a black woman columnist and we can actually use that. Right. You know, like something creative as opposed to confrontational. I mean, this is what gets me. The impulse is always a punitive one. Right. But it doesn't have to be. We are, you know, an organization that used to be collegial, congenial in the best workplace, which is why I stated this paper. In essence, what they were saying was that if you're black and a reporter and acknowledge in any way, shape or form that black people are held to a different standard in this country, then you're biased yeah. if you're covering race issues, which seems to me to be saying you have to deny your entire life experience and who you are as a person. So I found it remarkable, and I'm just curious, does what happened at the PG signal uh, larger issues about how the press nationally cover issues related to race? Well, since the lynching, of George Floyd, there seems to be something happening uh, because I think there's a this general awakening. Obviously, is something that reporters, especially reporters of color, are sensitive enough to sort of feel that this is the moment that you, you know if we're not going to rise up now over what we perceive to be 
structural bias in our own news organizations. When can we do this? And so a lot of changes and a lot of re-evaluating of journalistic priorities is happening right now. And these big organizations, whether it's the New York Times or the Washington Post, are responding to these internal pressures because now there's all this incentive to do that. All the eyes of the protesters are on all of these institutions and saying, what have you done for me lately? Why should I trust you as a source of news when you know you treat your own internal right. tribes of, of minorities like crap? That has a, a positive effect. I think that this moment would not have happened without you know, it's perverse, but without these these successive killings in Minneapolis and in, what was the other killing in Georgia? Georgia. <clears throat> Ahmaud Arbery. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the one since then last week, there's so many, you know, isn't that something like we have to go? Remember, yeah, you? well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's just flabbergasting that the list is so long and the names are so many. And yeah. that, of course, is the source of the rage. Right? Yeah, it's the source of the rage. And this, it has a cascading effect. And I think that it's causing us in journalism to say, how are we covering this? How come we haven't really covered this comprehensively until now? Why are we so shocked that there are these people in the street? It's because our coverage has always been in denial. We haven't really covered it the way we should. Mm. And at the Post-Gazette, there just isn't, isn't a knowledge of how to do it because they right. don't have people with the breadth of experience to say, you know what, this is how we should cover this. And this is how we should cover things in general in order to be more inclusive. Well, that's, you know, one of the big wake-up calls that should be happening for white people in general and white leaders in particular, I think white leaders in journalism, is that you don't know what you don't know unless you yeah. invite other people into the room. I think what you've called out is precisely one of the problems that we're all being called upon to correct, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is way more than a diversity issue. You know, it is, it is you. actually about combating racism in an active way by making right. sure that you have people in the room who, who make you do that. Right. It, it has to be self-conscious. And there were times when the Post-Gazette was going in that direction. There was a time um, in the, the late 90s or maybe the early 2000s when the late Lorraine Branham was the assistant to the publisher. And there was all this talk that she was going to succeed John Craig. Mm -hmm. And she was an African-American journalist. And she was going to turn things around dramatically. But once she got on the scene and was at the Post-Gazette, there was all of a sudden all sorts of objections to her progressive directions. And she left after about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. But that would have been the moment that the Post-Gazette could have changed and just gone light years ahead of all the other papers. Tony, you wrote a column titled to capital B or not to lowercase b. Right. <laughs> and that is the question, um, which dove into why the recent announcements that the Associated Press, the New York Times, USA Today, and hundreds of other newspapers across the country would finally capitalize the B in black. How did seeing that tide begin to turn on a national level feel? Did it feel like a cosmetic move or did it feel substantive and important? It can be cosmetic and at the same time substantive. From the perspective of the news organization, it was like, well, let's just get this thing off of the table so at least they'll be happy about something that we're doing. I mean, it's basically an update of the whole do you capitalize the N and Negro, which has been mm -hmm. us, uh, for years and years and years and years. It felt really good to see that. Uh, I thought it was like long overdue. And to Black reporters, we all felt united in this. Like, this is like a simple thing. But we can't get the big institutional newspapers to capitalize something that we all do naturally, you know, academics do. Most people, if they're writing letters or whatever, capitalize it. But it was just a, a continuation of the old Jim Crow politics, you know, like not giving an inch until you absolutely have to. Right. Slowly but surely, these little cosmetic things add up to, you know, a big revolutionary moment. And, you know, looking around, this is a revolution. This is a revolution in attitudes. Is a re I have never seen so much brotherhood, I mean, I guess that's a sexist word, whatever the gender neutral term would be for this sort of bonhomie between, you know, races and genders and cultures and so forth, to see 
so many white folks sort of involved because, you know, the civil rights movement, the freedom rides, this is like the freedom rides on steroids, except you don't have like the burning buses and you don't have any of that fatal violence. But you have a definite change in the psychology of this country mm-hmm. that is palpable to everyone. Everyone knows. I mean, you can read conservative news sources. Everyone's picking up on it. Things are changing. Mm-hmm. Now, their hang up is like they're pulling out all sorts of statues and that's, that's right. unacceptable. Yeah, 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 whatever. Heavy little pet thing over there. <laughs> but the Confederate flag yeah. is coming down in places where they refused to bring it down after nine people were killed in a you know South Carolina church. I mean, NASCAR, I, I just about yeah. lost my mind. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the pulling down the monuments. You wrote a column called that. And this one is, I find it so interesting. I grew up in an America that had a romantic notion of Christopher Columbus. Yeah. You know, then as an adult, you learn what really went on. Yeah. And I'm perfectly fine with taking down Christopher Columbus's yeah. statues. We don't need that. We don't need Confederate statues that actually celebrate people who fought for slavery and were traitors to the country. I think the romanticism that allowed those statues to go up in the first place should be investigated by adults, and especially in a revolutionary moment. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you wrote about in that column and and why you think it's important. Yeah, I I was writing about sort of like the collapse of the previous norms and the fact that there was this revolutionary moment and everything is being interrogated, all of our old values. And the statues, in, in many ways, embody that, tearing down the Confederate icons. Most of those monuments went up to be basically the personification of the middle finger to the civil rights movements uh, at various points in American history. They didn't go up in the aftermath of the war immediately because those were the losers and they mm-hmm. went up in the, the early 20th century. Yeah, they were an attempt to retell the story. Right. The lost cause was like, okay, and here were our heroes and, you know, you right. learn the names of these heroes and you learn to appreciate them. I mean, it was a retrograde movement. I think my only problem is when in this sort of enthusiasm and in this fury, folks who are a little bit ahistorical will see a statue of Ulysses S. Grant <laughs> and pull that down. It's like, well, you know, Grant is actually a pretty good president, and he wasn't uh, a Confederate soldier. He was a guy who freed a slave that he inherited and uh, was actually a good guy. So stop tearing down Ulysses S. Grant. And Do I think that you should be pulling down statues of George Washington, a slave owner, or Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner? No. You know, they they didn't work for the Confederacy, and they have a problematic history. So let's talk about it. Let's put things in context. Mm -hmm. I think we can have an honest discussion about icons and not pull everything down. Right. What we're seeing is a willingness to hold history accountable and ourselves accountable to what we celebrate and support. Yeah. Is there a column that stands out for you that you've written over the years, either in terms of bringing the most fervent public reaction or the greatest outpouring of response or anger? I I can tell you what column gave me chills as I was writing it and that it had a dramatic effect on how I approach columns after that. I mean, as you know, I'm from Philadelphia, from West Philly, and I grew up in a very homophobic culture. And I remember when Matthew Shepard was killed, crucified. Time to time, a single crime grabs the attention of the whole country. The latest example, the beating of a gay college student in Wyoming. Matt Shepard died this morning. He had been tied to a fence, pistol whipped, and left to die. Wyoming is one of 10 states that does not have a hate crime law. And the governor says he's still not convinced the state needs one. We shouldn't be running off as a lynch mob might, trying to look for vigilante justice, because that would be just as wrong as the act that we deplore already. I remember just sort of being confronted with the deep empathy that I felt for him and just being afraid to say anything about it because, you know, there was like all of this soft bigotry towards gay people in American culture, even by liberals. And I just said, screw that. If I got to go to hell, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to write a column that says that this is the most monstrous, barbaric thing that's ever happened. And that any time that anyone thinks that this is okay, just because of this guy's sexual orientation or who he is, 
is a monster. There was no one in the Post Gazette had written anything remotely sympathetic about Matthew Shepard. Hmm. And I wrote this column, and I just thought, from now on, you know, it's got to be about the Black experience. It's going to be about everyone who's been peed on, I won't use a stronger word, mm-hmm. you know, everyone who's been an object of assault in our culture. Someone's going to be on their side, and that's me. The Matthew Shepard incident sort of changed me and made me more cosmic in my disdain for evildoers. When I came into the next day, there were so many messages that it stopped recording them. Hmm. You know, like it reached the end. And by the end of that week, I must have had 1,200 letters of support from around the country. Wow. And apparently my column had been read at Matthew Shepard's funeral event, and it just you know, as I was writing it, I just had chills, like, you can't turn back, you know, from now on, you're going to be identified with this community. It's like, so what? Thank you for sharing that. It speaks volumes about you, and it illustrates precisely the growth that we are expected to have in life as adults, you know, where we leave behind the dated notions that maybe we were raised with, and we come to understand the world in a bigger and broader way. I just can't thank you enough, Tony, for sharing that story. It's, um, oh, it's powerful. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the only thing that sort of stands out. I mean, everything yeah. just seems sort of minor in comparison. But it clearly also set the stage for the justice warrior who has who has <laughs> been writing right. since. Uh, warrior, <laughs> and I mean that in the best possible way. You have two books coming. I want to fit in an opportunity for you to tell us about those. Well, I'm working on a novel, which is about reparations. It's called The Black Tax, and it's based upon that con game that was being run in the American South in the early 1990s when fake auditors would go to various churches and charge people $500 up front to file their taxes for them so that they will get $92,000 supposedly and reparation tax credits from the government. And of course, there was no such law and there, you know, there was no such uh, reparations. And that was mm. like a true story. No one's ever written about it. My agent is eagerly waiting for me to finish this. <laughs> and, and then the other one? And the other one is just a collection of essays. I've been approached by West Virginia University Press to give them a, a bunch of essays. Essays just about being Black in Appalachia, my observations about race and culture and so on and so on. So hopefully it won't be too boring. We'll see. Tony, we're unfortunately running out of time. I'm just curious what you want to leave people with, anything that we haven't covered or just any thoughts that you have that you hope people listening to this will remember. I am enormously heartened and I'm optimistic about the future. I've never felt this much connection to people across all sorts of what would have been barriers before. You know, we want to survive this pandemic, and we also want to survive as a more perfect union. And I think we're all starting to understand that, you know, you don't get too many chances to remake your country so that it's following the most idealistic aspirations of its creed. We're at that moment. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tony. I, you know, I'm struck as I've sat here talking with you. Your career has spanned so much time and so many. I'm old here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you and I both. But you've chronicled an important part of American history and told its story, I think, effectively and well. You've always been hopeful, but you're also fierce in how you hold folks accountable. And I really appreciate that. You were the first black columnist at the Post-Gazette, and late in your career, you're encountering the situation with Alexis Johnson and Michael Santiago and the having to fight against oppression in the newsroom 30 years later. Yeah. You know, Michael Santiago asked a question as he decided to leave the newsroom, mm. which was, why would I continue to want to work for a place that doesn't love me? And why would I want to stay in a place that doesn't love me? Mm-hmm. I think all of Black America is asking that mm. question, mm. but there's also nowhere to go. What we're all therefore being confronted with is the question of how can we and do we and must we create a place where everybody feels loved? I'm sorry that we're in this moment again. It makes me sad, but also angry. And also grateful for voices like yours, Tony, that you push us 
Thank you. We usually end we can be, you know, that's an incomplete sentence and a question of how you would complete it. We can be what? We can be far better than we actually are and we can be better than our highest aspirations. If we want to be, we can be. And that is the genius of your column because you ask us to do that. So thank you. All right, gentlemen. Thank you.